Welcome to another episode of the Fresh Cred Podcast. Today, we are honored to welcome back Richard Kottmeyer, a renowned global thought leader in agribusiness and ag tech. Richard has over two decades of experience transforming the agriculture and food industries, having led major practices and top firms. His extensive expertise spans technology, strategy consulting, and capital markets. In this episode, we dive into the evolving landscape of the agriculture industry post-COVID. We'll explore how the pandemic has reshaped consumer behavior, its economic impacts on the fresh produce sector, and the innovative trends driving our industry forward. We'll also discuss crucial issues like flood inflation, labor shortages, and the role of technology in agriculture. Richard brings a wealth of knowledge, offering invaluable insights into both U.S. and global agricultural markets. So get ready for an engaging conversation that spans from the farm to the global stage. The insights shared here are vital for everyone involved in the fresh produce supply chain. A special thank you goes out to our sponsor for this segment, Cactus Packaging Supplies. Enjoy the show. Well, good morning, Richard. Good morning. Oh, it's a pleasure to be with you guys. Hey, man, it is good to have you back. It's been a couple of years since we've seen you last. It has. It has. It was the first uh, show, major show, right after COVID. It was, yeah. It was for, for the ag Texas. business, for sure. Yeah. yeah, for us in the fresh produce business, we were there at Viva Fresh in Dallas, Texas, my my hometown. But uh, great, show. our first trade show um, yeah. podcast. So that was exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Was it our first? Yeah. I guess that it was, was our first in Dallas for Viva Fresh in 2022. Very nice. That's right. So anyway, but, you know, we had such a good time, you know, talking with you and talking about things post COVID. Of course. Right. I mean, it was right on the heels of that. In fact, I think we were still masking it uh, on occasion. But uh, yeah, we we had a chance. We're still dealing with post COVID. Well, and that's true, you know. And so I guess that's a good place for us to kind of kick off the discussion. Right. You know, the obviously COVID huge impact on everything, but particularly economically government pumped a lot of money into the economy and uh you know you had some thoughts on it and i think at that time uh the ukraine war was that's uh, right was kicking off as well and we we talked when i started being an advisor there yeah Yeah, so but but tell us a little bit uh if you can just kind of you know today really want to explore you know where's the world at a couple years after covid but but realistically you know economically uh in the ag space, what's going on here in the United States, but but also you know on a global scale. <laughs> so it all starts with the consumer, right? And so we have fundamentally, you know, when I talked to you last, we talked about how the consumer was going. To, it was a great opportunity for the fresh produce industry. And we said, well, wait a minute, COVID. You know, how does that become a great opportunity? And it's because you're moving, you're moving away from food away from home. Yeah. Right to food at home. And we talked about how when you do that, you tend to then trade up. In other words, I'm losing my restaurant experience, but I want a restaurant like experience at home. And so I'm going to buy an increased premium good. And that tends to be, if I'm cooking at home and I have that time, it tends to be a lot of fresh produce and meat and protein that happen. Okay. We're still going through that. But in the middle, we had the natural period of COVID's over. I want to experience life again. I all this bound up. And you see that in terms of just the enormous amount of travel that's going on around the world, right? And so we started eating at restaurants. But naturally, when you pump as much money as we pumped into relative to COVID, you're going to get an inflationary period. So anyone who Seems takes logical. Right. So anyone who takes the advice of this is literally the best time for innovation for the fresh produce industry. And because of a number of other factors, it's an incredible time to grant market share and share of wallet in the retail grocery sector. Yeah. And you've got all kinds of things working for you. So now all of a sudden we've got food away from home, going back to food at home, going to the exact same thing that we saw post-COVID. Right. And we remember what kind of volumes and what kind of numbers we were talking about oh, yeah, yeah. post-COVID. We're gonna see that, not as dramatically, but it's significant. 
and it's going to be significant for any company that's listening to this to understand your consumer is going to want a premium experience, but there's one change. That change is before, during COVID, they couldn't go out, they had time to prepare meals. Yeah. Now they're going to insist upon the premium product and they're going to insist upon convenience at home. Plus, if they don't have the experience of the restaurant, it gets to be costly. They want a better experience in their grocery store or wherever they do go and go out. So that how you merchandise that product is going to have to be increasingly important. And where is the real experiences in a retail grocery store? Yeah, three of them, right? You got the bakery. Yeah. You've got the deli slash meat. But the first thing and the most important thing is produce. Yeah. I mean, it's either produce or price. That's the only way you can win in retail grocery. And it's the first thing you're going to come to. That experience has to continue to innovate. Right. And then you just tie on all the other factors that play into this as well. So, health. Yeah, and the, the, the health thing, you know, obviously in COVID, and, and speaking to that, I was looking at a report uh, just yesterday right. on organics, and they had a, 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 their, one of their best expansion years was during the COVID. You talked about that trading up. People were trading up. They were going to eat healthy, and they were going to eat more organics, and it was one of their best years that they had in that or organic space in terms of growth in the category for fresh fruits and vegetables. So. You could see where the consumers were definitely leaning into the health side of it. And you can see how that's kind of trended a little bit the other way, right? We were seeing consumption numbers in the fresh fruit, fresh fruit and vegetable category, actually consumption wise, start to trend down. And people, you know, after post COVID have kind of started to switch back to maybe their old ways a little bit. So, well, that's not going to last long. That's one. But the most important thing to understand there is that the consumer, and you have to look at where did those volume decreases come in? Yeah. Right, and which of the fruits, which of the vegetables did they come in at? And so I think you're seeing more of a change or transition to how we eat fruit and vegetables that hasn't yet caught up with the sales side of the equation. Okay. But I think overall, you've got a fundamentally great future in that, you know, what will you have, 17%? of Americans have tried a GLP. We expect that to go up to about 20%, maybe 22%. You get insurance coverage, you're at about 30, 35%. Enormous. Now, the consumer industry normally thinks about this in terms of you're going to eat less. Well, now, GLP. Uh, GLP. Okay. Break it down a sure. little bit. Yep, so very simply, if you think about Ozempic, Wagovi. And Zempic, yep. If you think about weight loss control and, you know, the drugs that were designed initially for diabetes, type 2 diabetes, great at reducing appetite, at, uh, you know, regulating blood sugar and therefore losing weight incredibly yeah. quickly, right? And you have studies that are showing that, you know, 80% plus of that population does not regain the weight once they go off. Okay. That fundamentally changes what you eat. So for one thing, while you're on these drugs, processed food, fried food, mm -hmm. uh, junk food, very, very hard to digest. Yeah. And you've got to worry about, you know, cholesterol and your blood sugar on them. Okay. So you're told, don't eat that. Yeah. And if you don't listen to your doctor and don't eat any of that, there's some unpleasant consequences. <laughs> so now you're stuck with, I need to eat healthy and you start to eat a lot of vegetables. Over time, vegetable consumption kind of moderates. But what really increases is that fresh fruit becomes your sweet treat. And so there's an amazing opportunity for the fresh fruit side of the so equation you're, you're, long term. Your theory, We're talking 10 years. But term. your theory is the GOPs actually could be beneficial to our space. Incredibly beneficial. Hmm. probably more beneficial than anything that's occurred in the last 15, 20 years. Because I know the snack industry definitely has seen an impact. You know, the alcohol industry has seen an impact from the, the GOP. <clears throat> sure. Yeah. Fundamentally, what you eat changes. Yeah. How you eat changes. When you eat changes. How much you eat changes. And every one of those factors in favor of fresh produce. 
So I'll, if I'm going to pivot off of that, sure. that, that conversation. I want to go back to what we talked about back in 2022. And at that time, you know, the Ukrainian war, uh, and there was, you know, one of the things that you spoke of on a global scale was food shortages. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I can't tell that we've really felt that, uh, you know. I, I mean, I'd like to understand a little bit of what you actually saw, what actually resulted out of that, and why, why did it? Did, did it occur kind of like you saw it was going to play out, or did something it change did. that you didn't plan on? No, it, 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 well, things do. Yeah. Right? But overall, I would say I'm pretty comfortable with that we got that right, mostly. In other words, there were a number of changes of government in Africa in places where food and food security and food inflation mm. were critically important. There were any number of impacts to farmers we talked about the farming in, in Europe in particular. And I think we've seen this. We've seen first the demonstrations of the farmers in the government. We saw yesterday in the EU elections that very clearly there's a segment of the population that's saying we can't afford the kind of regulation that we were talking about earlier, the yeah. Green Deal, etc. And we were talking about the fact that, you know, the Green Deal was estimated that it could, you know, incre decrease GDP of the EU by a couple percentage points. And it could clearly, we would start most dramatically in just food inflation. That occurred. The consumer saying, enough. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't regulate ourselves into economic mediocrity. And so, you know, there's fundamental changes there. That's one. I think the other thing that's very clear that we got wrong was the ingenuity of the entire globe in figuring out how can we get grain and oil seed back. The ingenuity of the Ukrainian farmers mm -hmm. in terms of how can I clear anti-personnel landmines on my farm and get back in. How can I create a rail system in an incredibly short period of time to kind of go in there? How can I create, you know, a, um, a sea route that's close enough to land that it doesn't really lead to attack? All clever things. But overall, we did experience volatility. We experienced energy volatility in the EU. And... You know, it doesn't help when these things occur and you now have a labor shortage on top of it. Yeah, I remember grain, uh, potential grain shortage or concern regarding grain shortage was one of the things we talked about when we were together a couple of years ago. That's so right. It's not fully stabilized yet, right? It's, it's probably won't. It's just, we've just found a way to work around it. We're okay without a major shock, right? But we've come to a world and this is true with labor issues, et cetera, where you put a shock to a commodity and that shock ripples far greater than it used to, right? We don't have a lot of elasticity in terms of supply. And that's increasingly becoming a food security problem and unquestionably on the grains and then the corresponding meat side of the equation, the Ukraine plays an oversized role in that loss of elasticity. So tell me, so on a global, both global and then bring it back sure. to the United States, what's going on with population? <laughs> short, mid, long term, right? In the short term, we have countries that are already decreasing in population. Okay. Okay. In the long term. I guess, I mean, China probably being the biggest, uh, the one that is, is the most significant. Well, change. China, Japan, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, Asia. The Asia in general. In general right? it, yeah. it's a, it's a, so basically think about it as Asia, Europe, the United States, if the United States doesn't figure out immigration. Okay. Okay. So essentially, the more liberal your immigration policy, the more you can replace the fact that uh, wealthier couples are just generally having fewer children. Okay. It's as simple as that. Fewer, you said? Fewer okay. children. Right. So it's just as simple as that. This is an enormous issue in uh, farming. Um, so let's take global, we can come down to the United States. So we're already seeing a major change in who is going to be the farmer. We have a generational change coming. Mm -hmm. 
Likewise, we have to convince younger people who have more job opportunities because there is a smaller workplace mm -hmm. that they should live in a rural community that has fewer services, fewer access. The infrastructure is a little bit low, lower, and in some countries a whole lot lower, and that that should be their life as opposed to moving to a, moving to a city. Right. On top of all of that, you've got a number of jobs that really right now can't be replaced, but it's increasingly hard to get the labor for it. In the fresh produce industry, the clearest example of that is going to be how in the world are you going to pick, sort produce? For right? sure. And so population decline requires in every industry a focus on technology innovation. Okay. In other words, we have to, it's a classic agricultural sample of, of grow more with less. Now we just need to change that to do more with less. Oh, yeah. Right? So we right. literally have to do more with fewer people. And so anytime, and that poses a real challenge because a lot of the innovation, let's take robotics for picking fresh produce, mm -hmm. that's going to come at a pretty high initial capital cost. Correct. In order to afford that, you have to spread that cost over a larger farm. Just there's no way to imagine not a you know greater consolidation of farms. The farmer also has the unique opportunity and challenge of deciding which of all these new technologies should I use. They're very expensive and if I pick the wrong one or if I pick at the wrong time and they become more efficient but I'm stuck with older te technology, I'm at a huge competitive disadvantage. So the far family farm system, particularly in produce, which is a little smaller, is not really designed to be able to make the adjustment or the kind of capital infusion that's going to be necessary to deal with the issue that we don't have enough workers. Now, in the midterm and in the long term, you could cover a lot of this with a much better immigration policy. Cactus Packaging Supplies, your premier choice for quality packaging solutions in South Texas. As a wholly owned subsidiary of the renowned Mexican company, Cajas Agricolas, they bring over four decades of expertise and innovation in packaging, design, manufacturing, and distribution to South Texas. Founded in 1979, parent company, Cajas Agricolas, has been a trailblazer in the packaging industry. Their extensive experience spans the agricultural, livestock, and industrial sectors, ensuring that they understand the unique needs of each market. This rich legacy empowers Cactus Packaging Supplies to deliver products that not only meet, but exceed industry standards. Whether you require robust packaging for heavy duty applications or specialized solutions for more delicate items, they have you covered. Join the family at Cactus Packaging Supplies where they believe that their success is driven by the success of their clients. They're committed to building lasting relationships and providing unparalleled support to help your business thrive. For more information, email sales at cactuspacks.com or call 956-369-2055. But absent an immigration policy, you are literally creating a policy by deciding that you don't want to have a sensible immigration policy of removing family farms and moving closer and closer to true corporate agriculture. Now, if that's what we want, we can table the immigration issue. But, but if we want the family farm, we're going to have to deal with that. All right, but, but we've got H-2A programs. Not enough. And so, so what, is and the, the cost, what is the roadblock with the, well, you know, what, what, what do we need to do in that space, right? How do we change H-2A to where it's more user-friendly? Uh, yeah, user-friendly, effective. What are the things? It's got to be easier. All right. You've got to have 12 months that you can have them. Currently, you can't really keep your labor force for a 12 month period. You have to be able to uh, get the, them to return to the same farm. So there's an institutional knowledge that kind of comes in of, from one season or year to the next, right? So I want to be able to bring in the same people, mm -hmm. ideally. That's been problematic. 
you can't put the burden of enforcement on the farmer. So if I, if I bring them in, I house them, that's fine. I feed them, that's fine. But I also have to entertain them and make sure that they, do, they stay where they're supposed to stay. Yeah. Those unnecessary burdens, when you look at other countries using things like a guest worker program and things on that line. So you basically, base, fundamentally, you need to create something more similar to a guest worker program that puts more of the burden on government and less of the burden on the individual. I, I guess my it. question is, right, so, so, so the things you speak out, they sound logical, they sound basic. Who's opposed to it? <laughs> I mean, what, what, is, what, what is the reason we can't get there, you know, and then, you know, why, you know, in this We feel space, our country's changing, right? And, and this is true of conservative and national movements across the globe, and I'm not here to judge them. We can all do that individually. But I am here to acknowledge that there is this backlash toward cultural change. Right. There is this backlash toward kind of multiculturalism and a backlash toward, you know, this idea that, that people were just naturally going to assimilate and become similar. Well, by the way, that does happen. <laughs> that does happen. Over time. It happens over time. It happens yeah. over a couple of generations. And we always have this fight, right? You know, you go back in time and say, well, you know, they're, they're kind of different. And, you know, they're always going to be kind of different. And, it, you know, it could have been the Italians. It could have been, you know, Germans. It could be anyone at any period of time. I mean, there was a period of time if you weren't British, that was enough, right? Right. But <clears throat> you're literally looking at now how people consume media, how they eat. There's so much variety that you don't have that kind of common bond, that kind of common assimilation. And it's as simple as this. It didn't matter what you ate at home. You worked in an office, and you talked about the TV shows that were on one of three networks. Right? We don't do that. We don't have this common cultural base, and that's kind of, you know, people are on too. The trouble I have is that we can talk, you've got to be willing to do like we do in tax and in other things. You've got to be willing to say rural America and urban America are remarkably different. A mm -hmm. little less different in Europe because they're a little closer to one another, but in the United States, remarkably different. We have different tax rules for a farm than we do for other businesses, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's time that we start thinking about, you know, rebuilding rural and having certain things that are just fundamentally different in how we do them for a farm economy than for an urban economy, and we can start with immigration. So I don't think anyone who is anti-immigration would say, I'm anti, you know, farm workers coming in and picking produce so it doesn't rot on the field yeah. in a job that I don't want, and I don't know a lot of people who do want, and, um, and will lower my bill at the grocery store, right? That's not the fight over immigration. It's that if we can't slice off, you know, this is what's good for rural America, maybe different than the rest of America, mm -hmm. we're not getting anywhere. So with H2A, I think for most of the users or many users, the adverse wage effect rate is a big sticking point. Yep. Well, can you expand as to why that is and not being a user? I mean, I'm assuming it's the stabilization of wages in a specific geographic area, right? Well, it's kind of like a federal milk marketing order, right? You know, I, I no longer have control over over my wages. I mean, that's it's just that simple. So, you know, you are treating farms way too similarly. And not each farm has the same cost structure, has the same ability to, you know, pay at a different rate or really it's the same level of work necessarily, right? So we are, it's, a, it's just a good intention fairy in my mind. It has the right idea of trying to create a fair wage for, for workers that actually does anything but create opportunity, it just destroys opportunity. Yeah, it destroys opportunity. It just opportunity. destroys opportunity. Yeah. And so there's no variable no matter where you're growing within the United States. I mean. it, there's not enough. Okay. There's not enough. 
right? There's not enough. And look, just let's let's take some simple examples. I'm far more comfortable. Um, it, it takes more to get someone to pick in Washington State or Oregon State than it does in Southern California. Kind of simple reasons. Climate's more what I'm used to. Mm -hmm. I can get, you know, I can deal with families probably closer, a whole lot of reasons along that line, right? National programs and rules have to become more localized. And we have to have a set of rules for what does it mean to do immigration for, for rural America being a different set of principles, fundamentally a different set of principles than if I need to bring people in for the tech community or for the medical community. So we have a one size fits all kind of policy yeah, and it doesn't work. That, that, that's, it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. And that's the deal. I mean, you take, and we can get a lot more technical, but that's basically, but yeah, you, you, you take, I mean, the Southeast part of the United States, South Texas, Northwest, I mean, They're not the there's same. a multitude of differences. There's a multitude of cost, cost of living differences. Entertainment. Entertain, everything, you know, and trying to have a one size fits all. And, and again, you know. That's not work. It, it, it seems, you know, the frustrating thing uh, for, for, the, for, for me and for, for folks in the ad space, particularly, and, and ultimately the consumers is, you know, we're doing everything possible to drive up costs by not having an immigration policy by not making an H2A program that's workable or usable or more user friendly, all those things, everything, it's like eventually crops don't get planted. Well, I mean, let's, and prices even, go up. Let's, let's make it even simpler. We've got lots of national laboratories tied to important strategic industries, growth industries, ones that we say we must win, national security priorities. Where's my National Laboratory for Agricultural Technology? Where's the National Laboratory for the robotics? Because there's robotics in lots of different industries mm -hmm. being converted into ag tech. Why is it the burden of things like Western growers and to industry, create- Industry as a whole. Right. <clears throat> I mean, that's, you know, you're taking all of the risk that normally Basic research is something that government tends to fund. Okay, well, we say, well, extension services. Well, extension services were historically pretty good at breeding, pretty good at seed. Yeah. They're not really designed for, you know, it's going to take X million to create a prototype of a single machine that may or may not work. No. Nah. I mean, this is historically where you have a national app. Where's, we have a chips app. So we're going to spend an enormous amount of money ensuring that America is preeminent in semiconductor industry. Very good reason. Completely supportive of that. Okay. Where is the program to ensure that America remains preeminent in terms of food security, mm -hmm. in terms of food security's impact on national security, on global peace, on our position and status in the world? on our export markets. Because let's be honest, when you start to export agricultural goods, other goods follow. Mm -hmm. It's the tip of the spear. So where are those? So we fundamentally devalue that which we don't see and we don't understand. And so the American consumer doesn't understand agriculture. They're far away from it. And so it's devalued, and we need to find a way to get that to be back in value. That's one. The other thing is, you can see it's devalued because when we come to a climate decision, for example, who's the first one we say, let's fix that problem first, right? Let's fix that problem first. Water pollution, let's fix this problem first. Or water scarcity. Where are we going to go first to fix that problem? Yeah. It's always not me. Right? Yeah. And, and there's a lot of not me's <laughs> yeah. in an urban community. For sure. And fewer not me's in a rural community. And then there's this great question as to why do we have food inflation? We've been so efficient that we've made it easy for the consumer to believe there's nothing they can do, no burden they can put upon our industry that's going to make the price of food skyrocket. 
The problem is they just need to spend a little time in Europe. Yeah, for sure. They need to Definitely spend a little time in Europe. Way more expensive. But way more expensive. We can't go that way. And fundamentally, we can't go that way for, for the simplest and most moral of reasons. We can't go that way because the efficiency of our farmers has been a source of poverty reduction across the world and in our country. And what you're doing by over-regulating a farmer is hurting the poor every single time. Yeah. There is nothing greater, in my mind, than America's ability to create low-cost options for food for lower and lower middle income families who then have a significantly better quality of life than you're going to find in other parts of the world. They have more discretionary dollars. I don't understand, well actually I do, but it's frustrating <laughs> to understand that that message is like just, it, it's just hard <laughs> to get to, to someone to say, listen, your lifestyle is fundamentally tied to how you treat a farmer. It's fundamentally tied. And if you make that farmer's life harder, inevitably, your, your budget life. becomes harder yeah. and your life becomes your life. harder. That's, that's an excellent connection. Um, yeah, that, that's actually a very nice way to kind of wrap that up. But before you get out of here, the, the one thing I want to look is the future outlook. Right, so you've got the this global perspective, this U.S. perspective mm -hmm, right. on all these things. Ag, you've talked about technology, you've talked about the the worker situation. I'd like to know, you know, just a couple of things. One, from a technology standpoint, is there anything that you see? Number one, that that really stands out as the potential yes. solution, and then two, how do you think things will progress as it relates to? Uh, you know, H-2A workers, immigration, things like that. Just a couple of things on what does the future look like on some of these things Three that things. we're talking about. You've got the best opportunity out there, but that best opportunity, whether it's tied to the change in diet, basically fresh produce is going to capture market share, period, the end. Mark my words, come back to me, tell me I'm wrong in five years, but you're going to be buying me the steak dinner. <laughs> Make sure there's some vegetables in there. I like asparagus. <laughs> Second, um, the real risk is that with that success comes the, the need to produce all of that. Yeah. And we've made it very difficult, increasingly difficult to produce it. So if we don't make certain fundamental changes, the nature of who's going to produce food is going to change. And it's dramatically so in, in fresh produce because they are smaller farms. Yeah. You know, you are literally going to see a mass of consolidation if we don't make some sensible policies. In other words, we're making it too hard on the family farm. What do you think is more likely, the policy changes or the consolidation? Initially, the consolidation, but yeah. if food inflation continues, the policy change will be right there. Okay. I mean, you, you, you give me six more months of food, of, 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 uh, of, um, higher, food of higher food inflation yeah. after the next election. Right. So if you get a year after this new election and, and nothing changes, right, because everyone's kind of banking on something could change okay. one way or the other. Something could change. If that doesn't occur, if the Fed continues to say inflation is, you know, is my goal and interest rates are high. If all these things happen, you fundamentally are going to have consumer revolt and they're going to go after things, whether it's climate. That, of course, would help. Sorry. Uh, environmental water regulations, waters, United States, that would help. Yep. Uh, they're just, they're going to go after a number of these, these things and say, it, we just cannot afford it. And we saw this in 1980s and Reaganism, etc. right? There's a deregulation side tied to that basically bottom line costs and my living standard just started slipping. Yeah. We said the best way to do that is take, take the gloves off. Okay. Technology. The technology that makes the most sense and difference to the fresh fruit industry, more so than any other, is artificial intelligence. Now, artificial intelligence, of course, is backing up robotics to be able to pick. Mm -hmm. It's backing up also the agronomic side of the equation. So you've used 
people have, have, have typed in all their symptoms and come back and said, well, what's wrong with me? Yeah. Right? Okay. We, we tend to do that, telemedicine. And doctors tend to rely on AI. AI for that. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's not a whole lot different than a plant. Right? And so you've got so many commodities and you've got so... You don't have the same level of um, investment in kind of, you know, the common knowledge of what's going on that the soybean or the corn, for example, has. You don't have the same spending allowance. But with AI, you don't have to. And so I see fundamental improvement in the growing and the efficiency and the cost reduction tied to AI across the board in there. Here's the trouble. Had to gotta have be a trouble. trouble. Gotta be Had a problem. Trouble. It can't be just simple. AI is expensive to create. The technology is expensive initially, and then the cost is dispersed. Right. So the question becomes who's paying for that initial transformation? Right. There's my concern. So if I were to say, you know, what does the future hold? The future holds either the remarkable strength of the individual family farmer. All right. Because produce is fine. Now the question is, is the family farmer fine? Who's growing produce, the current family farmer growing produce today fine? Or, are they, or is this the beginning of a flip? That's entirely a policy and investment decision to be determined. I'm hopeful that we'll make logical, good decisions. I think the strength of our economy and rural economy has been focused uh, on on family ownership of, of, of agriculture and keeping small and mid-sized family farms viable. <clears throat> but just as in any in any any industry, right. when you become more technology dependent, if the cost to create that technology initially is borne by the industry, you lead to consolidation. We have to fundamentally decide, are we okay with that? Otherwise, the, the advancement outpaces the, advancement the, outpaces, the capitalization of, of exactly, the investment. Exactly, and you have to distribute that cost across a wider base of income. So we fundamentally have to decide how we want to treat that. Because I could see in the future, we talk 10 years out, yeah. that the logical model is not the family farm if we continue the way we're going. Now, for everyone hearing this, for everyone hearing this, that's not the reality Don't I think you and I want. <laughs> <laughs> that's not the reality you and I want. No. Okay? okay? But what I'm trying to get to you is that we have, we have to start understanding that the policies, whether they're immigration, technology, investment, etc., that that agriculture and protecting the family farm has to become a national interest, a security interest. And if it's not, well, the only logical choice is going yeah, to be and, a different capital structure. And uh, yeah, and, and, and I kind of I want to bring your 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 forecast predictions. Kind of want to bring those into a, I like a little concise deal. So the next time we're together, you know, we can kind of revisit these. But before I get to that, you know, I, I have a a, a somewhat pessimistic outlook on that because uh, given the amount of land that is transitioning to real estate out of the agricultural space, given the generational change where young people don't want to go to the farms, and given the fact that I don't see immigration getting fixed, I don't see, I, I've not seen anything, and technology is coming in. And we see that coming in. And so for me, your 10-year prediction, everything at least right now is setting the stage for exactly what you... And, see, and I'm more of me. an optimist. Well, and that's good. And, yeah, and, we and need an optimist, simple, we need a For a, a simple pessimist. reason. For a simple reason. <laughs> I'm looking at Europe. I'm looking at the consumers who just said, enough. Wow. Absolutely enough. I am not going to tolerate the loss of the quality of life and my economic quality tied to a series of regulations and poor policy decisions. Now, I'm not sure that they're entirely going the right way, but there is some advantage in saying enough. Yeah. 
right? And so if, if, if you're right, if immigration and come, if environmental issues come, can we all agree that food prices are just simply going to have to rise? No, for sure. All right. At what point does the American consumer say, this is now not, you know, somebody else's problem, something that I don't care about, something I'm, that's not, you know, on my top five issues, and it's becoming issue number one. It only took one oil crisis, right, yeah. to change that entire industry. Right. True that. That's a, okay. that's a good thing. You a have good... a similar kind of increase in, in, in food inflation. Right. Believe me, food inflation will get an impact globally far faster well, I mean, than look, the price of gas. Look what happened during COVID. I mean, the, the number of SKUs in the produce department went way down, right? So it was a focus back to the staples. I, I, I guess my... My comment is around variety, right? Variety might take a hit as far as supply, variety of items that's available to us in the produce Oh, variety department. went up. So we're used I was to, gonna say, the he, store, I, mean, I think in the store you variety the, went up. Yeah. The number of SKUs being supplied during Well, no, he's talking about during, during the during COVID. COVID. He's talking about since You didn't then. have, you didn't, no. During COVID, um, during COVID, there were a number of areas that had innovation and SKUs went way up. I mean, pasta is a great example. You had all different, all the different types of pasta that you could have, whether it was spinach-based, different color, um, you know, gluten-free, etc. They all went up as I moved in home. Why? Because there, that's real innovation. The consumer can feel that, right? The, the, the problem with the produce industry was not that it couldn't have increased SKUs. It was it did not come into COVID with enough innovation. We simply have, have, have had this belief in produce far too often that if we just have a new variety, a new flavor, a new, you know, what is the, you know, what, what is Impulse. the flavor, what is the flavor or product of the year, as opposed to how are we fundamentally changing how you eat produce, when you consume it, how you consume it, the convenience of it, what you're consuming it for. Those are the kind of innovations that led certain categories to have an explosion in SKUs. Here, you had a consolidation because all you, what, you're, what you were basically saying is, Let's take a bunch of, of fruits and vegetables that your first experience in a restaurant, you're not familiar with preparing, you're not familiar with picking, you don't know the quality of it, and when costs go, to, when costs go up, the experience better be awfully darn consistent, mm -hmm. right? I don't want a bad piece of fruit if fruit costs 2x what yeah. it does today. So you, you didn't, you weren't prepared you weren't prepared, and you suffered the consequence from it. Now, you know, you have a remarkable opportunity tied to health. You have a remarkable opportunity for innovation, for share of wallet, for share of the grocery cart by volume and what's being eaten, um, for, you know, the number of claims or reasons that people eat fruit and vegetables going up significantly. You have, I mean, everything's in your favor. But you have to balance all of these cost factors that you have that are coming up, right? And that's where farmers are focused on. They're yeah. always going to be focused on the cost. But if you leave the innovation side here alone, you're going to be in that same situation as COVID where you could have done infinitely better if you had made those investments. This really is the time to do what's counterintuitive to double down on the investments on the innovation side of the equation, knowing that all the market conditions are there for you to win, even though you're experiencing high costs, and even though you really just, as a farmer, you just want to think about things like labor before you think about things like innovation. And it, and it needs to be it needs in to be, parallel. It, it needs to be you, in you parallel. Gotta be able, you got to be able to you know, chew and gum and walk at <laughs> yeah. the same time. And then there's a lot of burdens on the farmer, but again... Tell me how you look at this environment and don't say produce is going to be a larger share of what we eat. And if you start from there, you can make some good decisions. All right, Rich. So, so next time we're together, we're going to have larger share of the consumer's stomach or the larger share of their dollar spend is going to be fresh fruits and vegetables. That's one. Two, AI is going to be the difference maker over the next two to five years in okay. terms of innovation within the fresh food space. And 
we're going to have immigration solved. Is that your three predictions that you want to hang your hat on? Yep. If I could make one policy decision that would help your industry out more than anything else, yeah. unquestionably, it is not immigration. No? Nope. AI truck drivers. Nope. Not that either. <laughs> I mean, supply chain's Yo. a big... Uh, I, I, I'm going to let it go. Okay. Nope. Uh, nope. Not going to be that. What is If there's one thing that would fundamentally change your future overnight, it's if you created the policy decision that the insurance companies had to cover weight loss medication. The dramatic increase in volume of and value and variety of, of the fresh industry would overcome almost all of the issues we're talking about today. Now, yes, they would exacerbate them, right? But you would be talking about such a fundamental large market opportunity, that would be the focus. Right. That is the single decision so what, you what, make. So what is your outlook? What's your prediction? In the next two years, that happens. 50? 50? 60? 40? What, what do you, you think is the odds that will actually occur in the next two years? Two years is really hard in the insurance and medical industry. Okay. But you give me three and a half to four years? Four years. I'll give you three. All right. We're, you're going to have to be at 60 to 75 percent for a very simple reason. You cannot go down the path of health care costs. Oh, and it's also really interesting, too. What's the if 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 this happened, right? So now you've got this enormous cost of just putting people on the medication. Yeah. That's going to come down. Yeah. It's going to come right. down. But it's still an enormous cost. They lose the weight. They get weaned off. What's the best way of weaning them off? A prescription of produce. Unquestionably, no uh, okay. doubt, no doubt whatsoever. Sorry. It's a prescription yeah. of produce, right? It's simply saying that you have to change how you eat. We're going to make it easier for how you eat. And if ever there was going to be a time for prescription produce, it's going to be to offset the cost of the weight loss drug. Perfect. All right. Well, that's a great close. You've got a few predictions we put on the record for the next time. Good. We I'm get, looking forward to it. We did okay last time. I think he was talking about moving back to Missouri to get into farming again. So back. we'll go to Missouri. Back to we'll, 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 we'll go back. to practice what he preached. Yeah, we'll go back there and preaching. see it. Well, no, but, <laughs> and well, I know there's you, a lot of good in this world that you can do in D.C. There really is. And there's a lot of policy. There, there, there's, I, I've encountered a certain amount of swamp. Right? <laughs> but... You know, where but here can you work on a policy decision that can get tens of millions of people out of permanent poverty? I'll tell you what, the easiest way that happens, food and agriculture every single time. So if we can understand it works in foreign countries, why can't we understand that we need to put the same effort in our country? Right. We've, we've just, we've devalued farming, farms, rural communities and agriculture, and we wonder why we're paying the price. Right. So the second biggest thing you can do, <laughs> teach the consumer that you're, they actually are paying the price for poor policy decisions, that it's hitting them directly in their pocketbook every time they go out to eat, every time they go to the grocery store. That national lab concept you mentioned, is anybody working on that? Hopefully. He's got somebody's ear that I, could do something, I think so I don't gonna, know. I, I mean, think we're going to get one. Yeah. I think we're going to get one. Well, we do have ARPA, right? So it's the DARPA, the mm -hmm. for Agriculture tied to the USDA. The next logical step from ARPA is a more, uh, a less theoretical and a more kind of engineering and practical kind of laboratory side of the equation. That's just the next logical concept. And it's really, you know, Tom, you gotta get, you gotta get in there in this fight, and you gotta just simply say, at the end of the day, boys, you know, if we're gonna have a chips act, can we have a farm act? And it's not a farm bill, you know, it's not, you know, providing money to farmers. Right. What we need is fundamentally to keep the technology innovation for farming. It needs to become that third kind of pillar in the USDA policy, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so I've got, I've got the risk side of policy, right? I've got the, uh, the SNAP and the food side of the policy. Well, there's got to be a third leg of that stool. 
And that has to be, where's the technology innovation That's side innovation of it? Side. How do I keep American agriculture as being preeminent? There is no reason, no reason logically that we would lose long term to South America. None, especially in fresh produce. Right. You're going to need them. It's not one or the other. But you've got every advantage out there if we keep bringing the, what American farmers have done better than anyone else is out innovate. Yeah. I mean, we don't have two growth cycles, right? No, we true. out innovate. Out, out innovate, for sure. Got to right. be the third, th third leg of the stool. Rich, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Wish you the best of luck the rest of your day. Pleasure. And, uh, we'll, we'll see you again soon. Thanks always, a lot. It's Take always care. fun to be on your show. Hey, gang. I hope like hell you all enjoyed this week's episode of the Fresh Cred Special Edition coming from Washington, D.C. Guys, none of this is possible without our partners, so I want to take a few minutes just to give each one of them a shout out. I'd like to say thanks to IFPA, Equifruit, Corner Image Packaging, Cactus Packing Supplies, SunFed, and IFCO. And also, please take a second, if you're not already following us, to go out to our webpage and click to follow so you can catch all the episode drops and all the shows that we're putting out. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you guys soon.